the very first ever AP Chemistry podcast. Welcome to the study of thermodynamics, the study of energy relationships in chemical reactions. So my good friend Danny's going to help me out with this podcast. Um, be patient with our audio quality. Um, Danny, can you tell us how do we know if a reaction is a spontaneous reaction? When it occurs by itself. So it just happens, right? And you don't have to make it happen? No. It yeah. happens by itself. Right. Okay, how about a non-spontaneous reactions? What can you tell me about those? Those you have to make. Yep. We would have to do something to make this reaction take place. Remember, though, that spontaneous reactions do not necessarily have a fast rate. Rate does not refer to spontaneity. You learned in the last unit how to calculate the rate of a reaction experimentally and to write the rate law. So in a mechanism, there will be uh, fast steps and there will be slow steps, but that doesn't mean they're all spontaneous or non-spontaneous. The factors that will have the most impact on spontaneity are temperature and pressure. And of course, we know those are related. So we actually have a way to describe how spontaneous a reaction is. We can calculate it as this component delta G, Gibbs free energy, which describes how much energy is available to do work. You see, like even in your body, not all the energy is available to do work. Most of the energy is used to maintain homeostasis, like keeping your body warm at the same temperature. Since no reaction is 100% efficient, then there's a theoretical value for delta G that's called delta G naught, or the standard Gibbs free energy. And then we would, of course, compare that to what we actually get in the lab or in industry so that we can describe what we're really getting for energy that's available to do the work. Okay, but we can only get the energy if the reaction occurs. In other words, if the reaction is spontaneous, the energy to do work can be obtained. Not all reactions are spontaneous, but being a chemist, I can take something that's non-spontaneous and make it happen anyway. That's why we need chemists in the world, so that we can make nature do what it wouldn't normally do all on its own. So here's an example where we have carbon dioxide gas turning into solid carbon and oxygen gas. So how do we decide if a process is spontaneous or not? Well, there's one factor to consider called entropy. Entropy is basically chemical chaos. So in any system, we want to be able to describe how much chaos there is. In this system, we have gas particles turning into products that are solid and some products that are gas. So think about the behavior of gases, the movement of gases. Um, they're moving uh, really super fast when they're gas particles, right? About 500 meters per second at normal room temperature. And they're colliding with one another about a billion times a second. So gases have a lot of chaos in them, whereas a solid has an inherent structure and order to it. So anytime that you are increasing the order, you are looking at um, decreasing the chemical chaos or the entropy of the system. Entropy describes the disorder in a system. It's the second law of thermodynamics. And basically it tells us that processes spontaneously move in the direction of maximum disorder or randomness. That's why your bedroom tends to um, tends to just naturally go in the direction of disorder or chaos. And if you don't put energy into restoring the order of your bedroom, then it will just keep getting messier and messier. So the reaction in the example of carbon dioxide gas turning into solid carbon dioxide plus oxygen is ultimately a non-spontaneous reaction at normal temperature because, um, because the entropy is increasing and that's not the normal natural order of the universe. Um, the law says entropy is increasing, 
not decreasing. So we would predict this is a non-spontaneous reaction. Let's look at um, entropy and phases of matter. Um, always the entropy of gases will be greater than the entropy of a liquid or solid at the same temperature, um, at any temperature, because gases just move in such random, irregular, unpredictable ways, and they um, just bounce all around. The entropy of a liquid is greater than the entropy of a solid for similar reasons. There's more kinetic energy in liquids. The particles move more. They're not locked into any given shape. Um, entropy for a reaction will increase when a solid changes into a liquid or gas. So that means you get more disordered. That's a more spontaneous process. Entropy also increases when a substance is divided into parts. For instance, when a substance is crushed into smaller particles or we grind it up, or if we were to take, say, an ionic solid, dissolve it in water, thus breaking it into the ions from which it is composed. Another factor to consider is the total number of product molecules compared to the number of reactant molecules. Entropy increases when the total number of molecules at the end of a process is more, is greater than those of the beginning number of molecules, the reactant molecules. An increase in temperature will result in an increase in the entropy because it makes particles move and it creates more chaos for those particles because they start bumping into each other a lot more. Spontaneity does not have to do with only entropy. It also has to do with energy. Remember studying delta H, enthalpy. We learned that reactions which release energy are called exothermic. Those tend to be spontaneous because you don't have to put energy in to make them happen. The energy comes out of the process. So those are spontaneous processes. Um, so if we have heat being released from a reaction and the entropy increases, the chaos or randomness increases, you have two spontaneous events, thus the entire overall reaction is spontaneous. Now suppose that you had an entropy increase where the disorder of the system increases, that's spontaneous, but it was an endothermic reaction, so you had to absorb energy to make it go forward. Well, if the entropy increase is bigger than the amount of energy absorbed, it's still a spontaneous reaction because the, the chaos increase can overcome the absorption of the energy. Now, suppose that we do have an exothermic process that's spontaneous, releasing energy, but the entropy decreases, so our system gets more organized, which is non-spontaneous. Then, if the en enthalpy wins out, the whole process is still spontaneous because of the heat. Now let's look at an example where heat is absorbed, endothermic, non-spontaneous. The entropy increase is not enough to overcome that energy being absorbed, so the reaction overall is considered non-spontaneous because there was not enough chaos to overcome the energy that had to be put in. Now what if we have a significant entropy decrease? So that now that it's getting too organized, not enough chaos to be spontaneous, and the heat that's released in this exothermic reaction is just not enough to make the overall reaction spontaneous because it's exothermic, but not exothermic enough to push us into the positive side of spontaneity. Now there's a final process that we can look at where heat's absorbed, so an endothermic reaction would be non-spontaneous, and the entropy decreases, the system gets more organized, that's also non-spontaneous, so overall the entire process is non-spontaneous. I want you to notice the size of the arrows here. At least in physics, the size of the arrow um, corresponds to the magnitude. The bigger the arrow, the more spontaneity or more non-spontaneous it is. So this is our biggest non-spontaneous arrow because both enthalpy 
and entropy are pointing in a non-spontaneous direction. So now let's look at the meaning of signs when we're um, investigating thermodynamic properties. Of course, with delta H, which we've already learned how to calculate in several different ways, a positive delta H is for an endo, bleh, endothermic process. That means uh, you have to put energy in for the reaction to proceed. A negative sign would mean an exothermic process, so energy is released or energy comes out. So think about this from spontaneity. If you have to put energy into the process, that means it's necessarily non-spontaneous because you had to put energy in. You had to do something to make it go. In an exothermic reaction, the energy is released, so that would be spontaneous. For entropy, delta S, more disordered is a positive change in delta S. That means that the chaos is increasing, so delta S would be positive. Increasing chaos is a spontaneous process, so positive delta S is spontaneous. If it's more ordered, that means there's less chaos. When we organize things more, we have to put energy in to make that happen, right? So delta S is negative, and a negative delta S is non-spontaneous. So overall, our delta G represents spontaneity. If delta G is positive, the process is not spontaneous because a positive delta H would be not spontaneous and that usually has more of an influence than delta S. A spontaneous process for Gibbs free energy means energy is being released, so negative delta G is spontaneous. That's the way the signs work. So in this chart we're just comparing magnitudes. If delta H is negative, delta S is positive, it's going to be spontaneous every single time. But if delta H is positive, which is endothermic, and delta S is positive, then it's only spontaneous if there's enough entropy to overcome the heat that's absorbed. So if we could have like a bigger positive sign for delta S and a smaller positive sign for delta H, that would be awesome. Spontaneous processes would be those where um, you have an exothermic process and if the entropy is also negative then your delta H has to be more negative than your delta S. It has to be a bigger value otherwise it's not going to be spontaneous. Um, just like in the next row down, non-spontaneous processes are those in which it becomes so much organized, so much less randomness and disorder, that the heat change is not exothermic enough to balance it out. Then it would be non-spontaneous. And then, of course, the most obvious non-spontaneous reaction of all would be one that requires energy and also increases the amount of organization in the system. Both of those are non-spontaneous. So the overall reaction is non-spontaneous. Here's a great example of how temperature influences spontaneity. So in this example, solid water is turning into liquid water. Okay, well, what's happening here? If you have solid water turning into liquid water, what do we call that process? Ice melting. Yeah, right, exactly, when ice melts. So when would this process be spontaneous? Okay, how much heat? Right, zero degrees Celsius. Any temperature that is greater than zero would mean this is a spontaneous process. So when would this not be a spontaneous process? Why? And we want it any time. It all depends on temperature. 